Okay. Let's see. Where is Holy Spirit wanting to start? Uh, he talked to me a lot about this month, and he had me go back even this morning and reread what Savan is and what this month is because we did the whole build up to Pentecost and had a wonderful party. I just loved the party. Did you guys like the party? It was a good party. <clears throat> and I just truly enjoyed it. It was just fun to be out there, even though we were winging it. <laughs> you know? We ended up sitting on the parking lot and looking at our tent. We yeah, paid they gave us a discount on tent so we could get to use it? Since they, they, they didn't get it them. because we didn't get to use it, but they did give us some for not putting we're up the, the gutter. gutter. Okay. Yeah. That was more getting to use it. So. Well, that's not the way they looked at it, because the truth is a lot of it does drain that way. So you can't, you know, I'm not going to die on that hill. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I just, you know, we get to that point, and a lot of times in Pentecost, once Pentecost is done, we're like, okay, that's good. And we don't realize that it's the rest of the month that we need to be looking at and specifically doing it. So he made me review again this morning what Pentecost and what this month is supposed to be. And some interesting things is this is the month of receiving your boundaries. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Um, some of you really like boundaries. You like having the routine, the same, the knowing. And when God pushes you outside those boundaries, it's uncomfortable. Okay, It's like, well, I just barely got used to this. I don't really <laughs> want to go to that. But this is, this is talking about not only those boundaries, but it's also talking about um, what I call mental boundaries. In other words, uh, we get real accustomed uh, to thinking a certain way, to processing a certain way. And when you start processing a certain way, it becomes a real pattern that you deal with everything in your life that way. And it becomes very, very familiar. And what ends up happening is when God's trying to process or help you think a different way, it's so foreign that we reject it before we even try the process. Uh, we reject it because it's just doesn't make sense. And I can remember in my journey of getting to faith, that was what I did. It's because faith isn't something I could uh, touch. It wasn't something I could see. It wasn't something I could do scientific protocol on. It was not describable in my process. And so what he had to do mentally with me is just tell me to fast. And that's the term he originally gave me. I want you to fast your thinking. Okay. And you don't realize how much your thinking is creating your spiritual level of knowledge. And um, so I began to just, you know, say, okay, I'm fasting my thinking. Well, I know y'all find this crazy, but I do a lot of thinking. And so <laughs> then Gary would tell me, he would say things like, well, just turn your mind off. And I go, I, I've never turned my mind off. I don't know how to, I don't know how to make a blank. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know how to just not think because even if I think about not thinking I think about not thinking and then I go to all those levels of not thinking okay I wipe the board clean there's nothing on it we're going to keep a blank mind I wonder what that <laughs> and then with just a heartbeat I'd be somewhere else so what he was trying to do and I don't know if I'm explaining this well but what he was trying to do is to stop the way I was thinking about him in my thought processes because I had established boundaries on God that were my boundaries, not his. And I couldn't see it because in my thought processes and in my logical reasoning, these were God. This was God's description. This is what God was. But when he started helping me evaluate it or look at it deeper the the thing that kept coming to me is I don't really I don't really know God like he's trying to get to me I don't really understand him 
So then I learned to make declarations. Okay. God is. I am. <laughs> you know? And I could. I am you. I mean, I, I used to take my therapy students, and they had to memorize the I am's. Okay. They hated it. But in their memorizing the I am's, I had to know them so I'd know if they were saying them right. Okay. So this was, it was a lot of mental things for me. One of the things God used in my therapy years, I was a learning disabilities therapist. And <clears throat> seemed like the most students I ended up with were the dys, uh, lexic and dysgraphic students, dysgraphia, um, then I'd have some auditory processing. So to help them understand the process of like reading for a dyslexic child, there are usually about roughly five steps for a normal child to read, to look at the picture or the words and to comprehend, make these things in the brain. For a dyslexic child, those five steps don't work. You have to add more steps to them because their orientation is right to left rather than left to right. The letters will actually float in some cases. They'll actually wave in some cases. So you have to add steps into that. So for me to be a truly good therapist, I had to do those steps with them, okay? So I had to integrate into my reading, which was five steps, I had to integrate seven so that I could see how they were needed to process and see how when they saw a B, it looked like a D. And to help give them some tools, you know, we used to do the things like how do you know if a B's a B or a D's a D? You put it in bed. And when you put it in bed, you see they're now looking at the B and the D so that they could have that mental image. So unfortunately, every time they came to a B or D, somewhere in their head, they had to add that other step. You see what I'm saying? So when God was processing with me, he said, what happens is when new Christians begin to make declarations they decree and declare a lot, but they don't walk it. They decree, I am this. They decree, I am that. Or they decree, God is this. But they don't take the action steps to walk in that direction, which could be anything. Uh, God is a God of faith, so he requires us to have faith. And to do that, we must actually show we are exhibiting faith. Does that make sense? So when we're showing it, he's going to give you opportunities where everything you are believing inside is not manifested in front of you. It is not logical. It is not something you can visually see. It is not something that even makes sense. So when our walk and our talk are not lined up correctly, then what happens is, we're just speaking a lot of words, but we ourselves are not aligning with our words. Does that make sense? We're not aligning with our words. And this is the month that that's what God encourages us to do. This is the month of receiving your boundaries and of alignment. And the interesting thing that's for this month is this is the month to connect your talk to your walk thereby making continuous ongoing progress in order to move from one level of strength to the next. So what he began to show me is just like we start with uh, kindergarten elementary students and we begin to introduce concepts, we, we begin to introduce different things. They need to go from one level to the next level. It's like when you're introducing the alphabet, they need to know this is the visual symbol for that alphabet. This is the sound that alphabet makes. Um, this is, but then again, this is the way you write it. See, those are all separate steps that have to somehow be integrated into the point where they can read and write and do those different things. Spiritual growth is the same way. A lot of times people see all the miraculous and all the supernatural and they want that, but they don't want to do the steps to get to that. And those steps are sometimes a little bit challenging because we argue with God. Or I did. Okay, so let's just call it that. So let me read Proverbs uh, 10, and I want to start with um, 
This is just the proverb that's talking about wisdom for today. And uh, Solomon's talking about what had come to him in gaining wealth through uh, wisdom. Okay. And I want to start with just verse 8. The heart of the wise will easily accept instruction, but those who do all the talking are too busy to listen and learn. They'll just keep stumbling ahead into the mess they created. So when when I first read that years ago, uh, I said, well, yeah, okay, I get that. And he goes, let me show you what I'm talking about. He says, when you're having conversations with people and it becomes a little bit confrontational and it looks like you're going to have to uh, stand your ground or you're going to have to defend your thoughts or whatever, are you hearing what they're saying or are you preparing what you're going to say to what they're saying? There is a difference. And the true listeners don't sit there and prepare what they are going to say to defend themselves in this confrontation. They don't think, well, now I can say this, now I can do this, now I can do that. But someone who doesn't accept instruction, that's a perfect uh, clue for them. So when you're truly listening to someone, you're paying a whole lot more attention. You're actually hearing the words they're saying. You're trying to understand their feelings or emotions with it. You're making eye contact with them. You're, it's a little bit more engaged. We have a saying that says, I see you, right? Uh, do you know how many people don't see people? Yes. They don't see people. I think we all need lessons on listening. The, I really do. Yes, because they don't, they don't see people. They see, um, you know, just kind of like, that person they see the blob of that person but to actually look inside and to be willing to risk what am i going to see when i see you (laughs) okay because that's different um it's kind of like we have that level of communication where we walk by and go how are you but you don't care for an answer you really don't care for an answer because you wouldn't ask that we probably wouldn't ask that question if in truth if we wanted to go have them vomit back on us what they are right but it becomes a habit that we get into so um, God just dealt with me severely because I did this I looked at people but I would see what I saw I would see what I wanted to see instead of looking with spiritual eyes and uh, I caught myself over and over in session after session of where I was thinking two and three steps ahead of what this conversation was going to go to and what I needed to say at this point. Okay, now I'm not saying that's evil. Uh, There are times God wants you to be prepared for that. But what it indicated to me was I wasn't really listening to this person. I wasn't listening to their heart. I wasn't listening to where they are. So... Let me read that again so you can understand from a spiritual standpoint what he's really saying. The heart of the wise will easily accept instruction, but those who do all the talking are too busy to listen and learn. They'll just keep stumbling ahead into the mess they've created. Hmm. See, it changes when we put a perspective on it that's not us thinking. It's different. And verse 9, the one who walks in integrity, and the word integrity for the Aramaic is innocence, or he who walks in perfection walks in hope. I like that. Um, So the one who walks in integrity will experience a fearless confidence in life, but the one who is devious will eventually be exposed. Okay, when you take that apart, what he's saying here is that this is the walk and talk part. If, you, if someone looks at you and what you say is the way you walk, then there is an integrity there. There is a hope there that you have got the wisdom you need. 
But how many of us know those people, including ourselves, that say and decree one thing, Mm -hmm. but our walk is not showing that we're on that same path? Okay? I know everybody's thinking of examples. Yay? (laughs) Right? So when he talked to me this morning about that, I just said, well, what do you want to focus on? And he said, walk and talk. So this is where we are this morning. So uh, each of you has wisdom that you have learned in your walking and talking. Okay. You've each learned some by horrible failure, some by God just kind of tapping you on the shoulders. Share with us today some of the things that God's helped you understand on what does it mean to walk and talk. And it may be from, well, like, you know, your counseling or your, or your life experiences. Or can you think of an example that would help people? We're not just going to use online. Explain that question a little bit more. <laughs> okay. What I'm saying is, have, has Holy Spirit quickened to you or convicted you that your walk and your talk are not the same? Okay. Okay. That maybe you had a life example or you caught yourself doing that. Okay. Yeah. Do you want an example? Sure. Sure. Well, yes, a, a few months ago, where I feel like this fits is um, I'm praying for things in my mouth, you know, for healing, different things. And I heard very decisively. Take corruption out of your mouth oh. with my speaking. Okay. And uh, that could be on the scale from anywhere at that time. It could have been really, <laughs> or it could have just been speaking contrary to the word of God. Okay. That those words are corrupting when we speak contrary to the word of God. And so anyway, and interestingly, I've been doing better with that, but it came again this morning because I was praying about it again. Okay. And, you know, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, if you don't want corruption working in your mouth, you cannot be speaking corruption. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Wow. Yeah. And that's a physical <coughs> manifestation, <laughs> you know, of how we have the corruption. We undermine so many times we will make a declaration, or a positive declaration, and then right behind it you undermine it with two or three other things, uh-huh. you know, quickly quickly not even realizing our program thought processes do that so yeah good example anybody else walking and talking is where we're at today (laughs) I know you've had something so say I'll do it this way Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, would you quicken to each of them in their memory banks a memory, a time that you corrected them or helped them get aligned with their walking and their talking in a situation? And as they're triggering, I had a problem with one of my sons, and... um, how oh, y'all don't imagine that, but I did. Lots of problems, okay. But <laughs> this was a strong-willed child uh, that strong-willed children have this idea that when you tell them this is the boundary, to a true strong-willed child, that means that's the go line. Mm-hmm. That's the go mark, okay. It does not mean that's the boundary where you stop or you do. To them, that's it's like, starting place. let's make sure she means that. Okay, let's make sure she means that. And so I had confessed that my children would be taught of the Lord and would hear the Lord and everything, and they would do that. And so every time this child challenged it, all I could think about this child is the negative things, okay? Um, the evil of like, you know, you're going to get hurt. Okay, this is this is not good. You, all this stuff, 
And what I would end up doing is that's the conversation I would have. It's like, what were you thinking? Why are you doing this? Da 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 da. And I would just, you know, it was a very negative thing because I was frustrated to no end. And so I finally asked God, what on earth? What is? What am I doing wrong? And he says, well, first of all, you're not understanding. That's how I made him. And I said, you absolutely made him to break the boundaries? And he goes, yeah. And I'm thinking, well, how evil is that? <laughs> okay. Because that just makes my life living hell, okay, <laughs> because of all this. And he's, no, I on purpose made him that way. And I go, well, why? Why would you do that? And he says, because where I'm sending him, all the men, all all the people in his life are going to tell him he can't do it, and it's not right. But I want him to listen to me. And I want him to go to the boundaries and the places I want him to go to, outside of what society says he's supposed to do. And so... He said, so it's challenging for you right now, but he he will be all right. You just have to stop confessing all that garbage over him. Because until you see my image for him, you're confessing the wrong thing. And, you know, he said, there is safety in doing my boundaries. Now, they won't be yours all the time, but there's safety in doing mine. And it's true. By the time he was 17, he had already broke almost all the man-made boundaries on what a 17-year-old does. He had already made his own business. He had already purchased his own trailer. He had already purchased his own equipment. Do you hear what I'm saying? He had already started his thing. He was also going to college and doing missions work all at the same time. And everybody said, you can't do that. Watch me. That's what's it. So that's an example of me having to realign my mental thinking of what is safe for a child because I couldn't get the vision of God of what he had for that child. I just had my mama vision, okay, of protection. Does that make sense? So when I aligned with God, then he could walk to his vision and be where he wanted to be. Okay? Okay. So my example is more in line with what you shared. Maybe it's not answering the original question. But I was walking yesterday, and I was thinking about, um, I was just praying and asking the Lord, well, if I'm going to have to teach on this topic. (laughs) (laughs) She's still hung up on having to teach the ruler gift. Okay. (laughs) Well, I was like, Lord, if I have to teach on this, you're going to have to show me if I even am this or how I am this or ways in my life. So I, like, I'm not even anywhere near ready to teach on it. I'm way out here. May not even be ready by the time I'm supposed to. (laughs) But my walk has been, okay, Lord, show me these things about me, how you designed me. So that design thing was big. And also the piece of looking at what's after Pentecost. That's huge because you're right. We stop there. So the Lord has been bringing more of what is this time and season into me. So I'm connecting some things. So it was like this is the month for the, the mercy to complete some things. So I began looking at that. How does God design it? You know, connecting, involving, all these things are coming together. And I was like, Lord, I can complete things because I can push through. I mean, willpower is not an issue. But I was like, so why do I have all these things that I start and stop? Is it willpower? Like, I'll start reading a book. I have multiple books that I've started and I haven't finished. Do I need to be more disciplined? And I have all these things right now. This has been an interesting season, really crazy, of not working but learning what life is like and what I'm supposed to be doing. And then he was like, all of a sudden he showed me, why are you defining completion by man's definition? You know, because I look at these things and I'm like, I can push through. But one of the problems with the ruler gift is that they can do a lot of things, but are they doing a lot of good things, but are they doing the best things, what God designed them to do? So I can push anything you set before me. I'm going to figure out how to do it and push through and do it. 
But so I was just stepping back and looking, and God said, what if I told you to read a piece of that book because that's the piece that you need. Right. But you're wasting your time, and my time, by completing it because you don't think you've completed it. Or what if I've put you over here to pick up this piece? Because I'm doing that in, like, learning spiritual things right now. I mean, I'm all over the place. I'm putting, getting all these pieces, but I'm not, like, finishing this one training or this one thing. And, it, and I was like, Lord, what's going on with me? I'm, I've never really been like this. I've finished things. But he was like, maybe that's the way I designed you. I designed you. You don't need as long to get that concept. You get it. You pick it up, and you have it, and it's yours. And then you pick up this concept, mm -hmm. and it's yours, and you've learned it. But you don't have to read the entire book. Because those words just, like, <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? I just, like, give me the concept. I've got it. I, the I, cliff notes. Mm -hmm. The cliff notes. I love the cliff notes. <laughs> so that was about design and looking at, okay, instead of fighting this, maybe I need to see how did God create me and how, how can this work for me. Good. Instead of fighting against it, I can let it work for me. Mm -hmm. Does that make a little yeah. more sense? Yeah, yeah. Because you've defined what you think ruler is, and you were almost, well, I wouldn't call it rebellion, but hesitant. I'm not that. I still, <laughs> I still am. But yet, it is equal to your prophecy. And that's why there's problems with it. So <laughs> I'm not a typical just ruler because no. I have the prophet piece right. too. And so right. it combines. I need to create my own and call Your it own something else. Category. Like okay. ruler. Ruler. <laughs> <laughs> prophet. Ruler. Ruler. Like ruler. Because it's not a pure. Is that? Well, that's how we all are. Yeah, 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 but your top two are here and here. My top two are, bam. <laughs> <laughs> they're like the same number. <laughs> so they're either going to compete and kill each other or they're going to have to become friends. So <laughs> Maybe you need to look at the design of God. I'm all for that. Let's do that. And, and that was something I was thinking when I was walking. I was like, okay, there is this piece and there is this piece. But God, I, that's exactly what I was praying. Just give me your piece. How did you design because then you can truly walk it his way. I don't know about you guys, but I found I thought I was walking his way a lot of times, and it wasn't. It was my interpretation of his way. It wasn't his way. But I couldn't see that because I didn't have the design piece inside of me to hear what's your way for me. Because if it went against what I thought I was, there was an argument inside of me. So he's trying to help us this month to get to that place where we can see our design and we can realize in aligning with him, we got to get some of our own junk out of the way. No? Okay. Anybody else? Mine goes along with what you just said. So I'm listening to kind of like Lori, multiple people, but they all are relevant. And they're all about inner healing, integrating, cleaning up the soul, allowing the spirit to lead and but you got all these different perspectives coming in and just kind of finding out just but then I have ministry too and I'm like Lord I can't do that without doing this first so get me here over here cleaned up so I can help these people with what they need yeah. so walking and talking and doing it all is it's, it's fun yeah what <laughs> what fun. is it that's one perspective what what is the hardest thing in that for you I'll just interview you a minute what is the hardest thing for you that you've had to overcome in your own thinking and training making a mistake making a mistake why I is that not like making mistakes you don't like making mm -hmm. mistakes no not in any area of my life okay and so if I make a mistake that means somebody else is gonna not get their fullness from what I'm trying to learn and apply right I can't make mistakes you can't make mistakes so have you given yourself permission yet to make mistakes? I want to make them all the time. I like them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you can see how just the fear of not making mistakes will make you not mm -hmm. even it just risk. just reinforces my soul. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Okay. Listening. Tell us about listening. It's reflection. Okay. If you're going to listen to somebody, you have to hear what they say. You have to say back to them what you hear then you're actively listening. I tell that parents all the time. If a child needs to be heard, if they say, I hate you, say, I'm sorry that you're upset and that you hate me right now. 
Mm -hmm. Don't take it personally. Just right. reflect what you hear. That keeps the open dialogue. That keeps them talking. That gets out of their head and let them express themselves. Their feelings are valid in that moment. Right. And so that's what we have to do. We have to reflect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes with the maturity of the person because some take it as a wound. Yeah. You know, you hate me after all I've done for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's all they can focus on. Rather than, like you're saying, you know, reflect back, say, I'm sorry you're in this way. Yeah. You know, it keeps it open so where they can tell you what, and they may hate you because you didn't give them an extra french fry or something. Right. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with what you've assumed right. the hate is. But in our immaturity, we shut them down because you're saying hateful things to me, you're disrespecting me, you're not honoring me, especially as parents. You see what I'm talking about? So, in that parenting relationship to God, mm -hmm. he's got the dialogue open, okay, and he's trying to say back to you what you've just said to him so you can hear and be able to, to express it. I think that's the thing that helped me risk uh, making mistakes and doing things wrong was because he said, it's okay. See, in my world, it wasn't ever okay because mm -hmm. I didn't want to look like I made mistakes. But when he gave me permission to learn and to succeed and to fail, do you have that gift from God that you are allowed to fail at something? That it's allowed to overwhelm you or overcome you? Do you have that? Are you looking at me? I'm not. See, there we go. <laughs> do you give yourself that permission? I'm just looking at someone else for change. <laughs> Do you give, you give a break? No, no. She thought she'd give you a break. Whatever. But if you don't, you put these high standards up to where you miss, you know, how many times have we read about David and all these people? I think they failed. Do you think they had moments where they failed? Sure. Okay. Did God leave them in that moment? Never. Never. Peter. Whoa. <laughs> you know, think about that. But if you don't give yourself that ability to grow and to say, the chances are good that I may not be perfect. And the chances are good I may fail. I may not look right. I may not talk right. But that doesn't mean I've completely, you know, failed my mission of God. It just means I'm learning and getting back up and doing it again. And I'm learning and getting back up and doing it again. I didn't like failure at all. So I would not enter into some things because unless I could secure that I wouldn't fail, I wasn't playing. <clears throat> you hearing me? Unless I could secure that I would be perfect and that everybody would see me as the one who got the stray days or the you know success, I would just avoid those situations. Uh, and, ex and I didn't realize I was doing it until God told me, he says, so you can't do math. I go, no, can't do math. He goes, really? I go, yeah, can't do math. I was told I couldn't do math. Well, I was told because I was a girl I couldn't do math. Okay, so <clears throat> we were encouraged to go into other realms of things because I was going into a field that was heavy in math in the beginning. And uh, bionics is the field I was wanting to do. It's heavy in math, and I was like, uh, you're not really good in math. I said, okay, but you know what happened? If they don't call it math and they call it something else, I succeeded just fine in it. Like chemistry, I have a minor in chemistry. Like music, if they didn't call it math, I could do fine in it. <laughs> Do you see what I'm trying to show you this morning? How the enemy uses how you perceive yourself and where you are walking and talking. God. That failure thing's hard. I don't like failure either. I remember when <coughs> I was young. I, and the failure thing for me is not so much what it does to myself. It's I don't want to disappoint other people. That's what she was doing. And I remember when I was young at my dad's house, for some reason, I don't know why, I was a kid, I threw my brother's baseball glove on top of the house. I have no idea why. And... Like, I didn't lie very often, but I lied, and I said I didn't do it, and I blamed it on my little brother. Well, my little brother failed all the time, so it was no big deal. He got in trouble all the time. <laughs> so, really, it was no big deal. I mean, he just took the blame, and, I'm like, 
you know, he did, he was used to it. He was used to getting in trouble, but I never got in trouble because I never did anything wrong. Uh, and when I did something wrong, like I hated it. And so I, I lied. I blamed it on him. And my grandpa joked about it all through the years. Then my brother made up a story that a bird took it up there. <laughs> <laughs> years later, years later, I was an adult and we were at a family Christmas and finally I admitted that I threw it. It was hard for me to admit, even as an adult, I threw the glove on top of the house. <laughs> but I hated it. And lately there have been some things that I have messed up or kind of really close to messing up or getting it wrong. And I don't know if God put me in those situations, but I didn't know. It was things I didn't know, and I hated that. Like, I messed up. Like, I should have known. I was here when they delivered the tent. I should have known that there was supposed to be a gathering. Oh, I never dealt. I know. I'm just giving you an example. It really bothered me because if I would have known that they were supposed to put a guttering up, then possibly, or Gary and I got to decide where to place the tent. If I would have known that it was going to rain and it was going to run <laughs> off that and then I made the final decision I was the one that was here I said I will take care of it it was my responsibility have we no, forgiven ourselves I had no idea that tents have matters I've never dealt with a big old white tent they were like does this look good and I was like yeah it looks, well, it's good. Good to me. it looks good to me and I was so upset with myself and I was so I apologized to Linda and I was like Lord so but here's the piece I don't have okay so I messed up I didn't know I had no idea there was also a thing a while back. I had no idea. It was such a huge deal to you. You know what that was? Yes, I do. Just didn't know. Wasn't even on my radar. Nowhere on my radar. Okay, so you go, you can't blame yourself. But then I go, but I am prophetic. It should be. <laughs> Lord, you, you should, should have, have had it. <laughs> that's his, his fault. fault. Wow. <laughs> no, really, that's the point I go with that. Wow. Like if I was listening to the Spirit, I should have known that. So that's where I'm at now. So do you have an answer for that? <laughs> Even if I forgive myself for not knowing in my soul, I should know. Yes, because I don't think yeah, that's you're. That's tough. I, I don't think. Well, if that's true, if just because you're a prophetic person, you know everything, then the rest of us could quit. And the more you get yourself involved in things, the more uh, the more it affect your actions affect other people. Like if I would never have volunteered to help come up here and be here with a tent then it wouldn't have affected him. So you take that risk. Mm -hmm. And did you notice we managed just fine? We did, but I know it was your heart because you wanted to be in that tent so bad. And that's what bothered me. Like you had the vision of the tent. But it was there. And you wanted to be there, but you wanted to be under it so bad. We had a different tent, right? We had a different okay. tent. I'm just giving you an example. I know, I know. But that's the difference between the physical and, it, and the spiritual. those things make me want, it didn't this time. But in the past, those things made me want to run. That's what she's saying. Big yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, how many times have I almost had my shoes laced up and been out of dodge? Yeah. And you've been like, oh. Enough and of she's that. She's grabbed a hold of me by the nap of my neck as I'm running away. <laughs> because I think we have to realize failure is part of the equation. Okay. It's part of growing and learning. It's hard. But if we set ourselves up so we're not supposed to fail because we're God's whatever... Hello, that's too hard. I mean, if David failed, <laughs> if Peter failed, how many of you sat with Jesus in Bible school for three years? No. How many of us had a face-to-face, -face, saw him do all the miracles, saw him do all that stuff, and then he failed? I think we can give ourselves some mercy and grace, which is what this month is. So in the mercy to complete things, one of the things I would encourage you to do is realize it's mercy to complete you. It's mercy to complete you. We've been into identity for so long because we have such a false identity of you know who we are. But see, in just using the tin example, you know, I was like, okay, it is raining cats, dogs, elephants, and kickledoos. You know, it was ridiculous when I woke up and I go, Lord, I thought you said it wasn't going to rain. He goes, no, you looked at the weather cast people, and they said it wasn't going to rain. The radar at, right, when, I, when I left the building at, yeah. uh, what time did we, six something? The radar looked like it was going to go right around us. Yeah. And then I get home, and all of a sudden I heard thunder, and I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, I'd been watching the whole time, and at the last minute, bam, it came oh. over us. So, again, he just said to me, as, as it was up, he says, 
well, that's a good thing. And I'm like, no, it's not a good thing. We can't be under the tent because now it's standing water of at least two inches under the, under the tent. And I had to call and tell you that. And you were like, well, I was like, there's water under the tent. Like, well, it'll be all right. I was like, no, there's a lot, a lot of, of water. water <laughs> so it's, I think these are the things we have to realize. When we do life our way, we can get disappointed, we can have failures, and there's no redemption because we just feel bad about those things. When we do life God's way and those opportunities come up, we can literally say, you know, God was not surprised we did not use the tent. God was not surprised. He was not surprised when, you know, hard money was put into securing the tent. He wasn't surprised at that either. He wasn't surprised that we all got to sun out on the parking lot. He wasn't surprised at that. But it was a surprise to us. (laughs) So we assume, because it's a surprise to us, that somehow we missed God, or we didn't do our part, or we didn't do whatever. And a lot of times, it's just learning to flow in his boundaries. Do you think everybody looking out there, and when I said, Lori, just line the food up on the sidewalk, did you see how many people ran out there to help? Lots of people came out to help put the stuff up and to do unity and community. Some of them realized we couldn't sit in the parking lot with their cars there, so they moved their cars. And just things like that. So it was so many times it was like God's example of, I'm moving you. I'm moving you to the different place. And the tent to me was representing covenant. It's like a hoopah. It's like a wedding uh, canopy. That's a Hebraic thing that represents your cutting covenant. And so what I saw is all these people realizing They can cut covenant in the natural and go sit under the tent. Or they can cut covenant with God in the supernatural and sit in the parking lot. See, no one really did that. But what ended up happening is they created a circle, how convoluted it ever may be, of all the people getting their chairs out and surrounding it. And it was almost a circle of God. And everybody was enjoying it and having a fun time. And the kids had plenty of room to scream and holler and play. And it was just a wonderful day. But if the enemy gets into our thinking, he can take the things of God and shift us all around. Yeah. Because you can be done. If you're scared of failure, you'll never be a leader because you won't take that risk of responsibility for other people. And okay. that's, that's what my battle is right now. Yeah. If you're scared of disappointing other people, you're not going to pick up those responsibilities you're not going to want to leave because you've, how many times have I said like, I'm, I'm done I'm done I'm, I'm, done. Done. I'm, done. I'm done which don't say that to her never she, say you're done to she me she hates so. that yeah yeah that's just my starting <laughs> lines right challenge. there <laughs> no, it's, it's challenge. It for, for her it is it you say you're done yeah I have a challenge let me show you where yes. done is okay <clears throat> So I just want you to put the pieces together today. Uh, Is your walk managing to be with your talk? And they are separate. That is one of the things he wants aligned this month. And it's a lot to do with your thinking. It's a lot to do with your thinking. So before you, you know, I used to feel guilty for telling God how all the things I really felt because most of them were negative. Okay. And I was like, I'm not supposed to say negative things. How many of you feel that way? I'm not supposed to, you know, I was raised in the word of faith people. Okay. You just didn't say you had a cold. I don't care if you had a 102 fever and snot was running out your nose and you had a headache you couldn't believe and you were coughing on everybody and they'd say, are you all right? And go, no, I don't have a cold. And I think, okay, where is, where, do you hear what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. There is faith, and then there is, okay, you might have faith you don't have a cold, but this is not the same thing when you're contaminating all of us, okay? Because it's in you. So you can have the faith for healing. You can have the faith to do that. But that was an example. So what he had to do with me is help me realize 
I called it my safe time. I would say, I bind Satan from hearing anything I'm about to say because he could use it against me. But I need to get it out. Oh. Are you listening? Because I had so many of these negative and anger and frustrated. <laughs> and I was like, I'm pretty sure this isn't supposed to hold it, be holy, but I just really need to get this out. And so I had a safe zone. And I'd say, Satan, I'm buying you. You can't hear a thing I'm about to say. <laughs> okay. And then I'd go, Holy Spirit, could you just help me? Because this is what I'm feeling like. And this is what I'm seeing. And this is what I'm hurting. And this is, what I'm, this is why I'm crying and screaming and all these things. And when I got through, then I'd go, okay, we wash it in the blood of Jesus. So that it cannot be used against me. But it's my learning process in that I'm learning I'm not evil because I still have things manifesting in me. Um, I've shared this with you guys a million times. Gary can probably make me madder faster than... There's only really two people left on the planet that can really do that. And it's Gary, and we won't name the other person. <clears throat> They're not in the room, Lord. <laughs> But they are the two people that can just make me lose it, okay? But they're also two of the people that are closest to me, that I've pulled my, most of my shields down and I've lived life with. Are you hearing me? So their ability to trigger the things that are not yet redeemed in me are high, high, high. And, you know, I'll think, look how holy I've been all day. And then, okay. And I'm just glad that it's not videotaped so that it could be used against me in the court of physical people. <laughs> okay. But I just want you to understand this is the month to give yourself some mercy for us to complete our identity. And when you recognize your walk and your talk is not there, he's trying to show you it's your thinking. It's your thinking and your patterns that are creating these horrible places in you. Some of you have dealt with so much insecurity and self-confidence uh, that the enemies just really kept you in a place that was not God at all because of that. Some of you were confident in the things that weren't important to God. And so this is that alignment time. So I encourage you to just say, Holy Spirit, just will you shine your light on where I'm walking and how I'm talking? And is my walk going left and my talk going right? Or are they on the same road? Are they coming in alignment with each other? And this is where wise people hear the instruction of Father. He does not expect you to be perfect like this. He doesn't. He doesn't. He expects us to be learning and growing and making mistakes. You know, when a child's learning to walk, we don't really expect them to just hop up and run. But yet in the spiritual world, what do we do? If you don't run well, you're you're condemned, or you're slapped, or you're made to feel bad. Hello. It takes a while to learn. So don't beat yourself up, but do be a little bit more eye-opening to what's really going on with the walk and talk, okay? Uh, when it's talking about it, and I encourage you to go and reread it again, but this is the part that he says, um, this is the month it's important for connecting your talk to your walk. What you are decreeing has to connect with what you are walking. So a lot of you are making big faith statements. But he's going to give you action steps to make sure your walk is in agreement with your big faith statements. And if they are not, I'm going to believe that he's going to trigger or ring a bell for you so you can see how they're not coming together, okay? It's not to condemn you, it's to instruct you. 
it's to help you. So you start walking in what you decreed in the first month. So when we were in Passover, we were saying we're redeemed, we're free, we're getting out of this. So that's what we were beginning to say. A lot of people will make decrees, but they never walk them out. One thing I try to do, and this is Chuck talking, I try to get the vision in place and moving in April, and then I go to the next level in June. So what we've asked God to do, and specifically our covenant time with him, foundational thing, has been about identity. You really have to have the design of God. You have to know who God says you are, not who Yolanda says you are, or who your parents said you were, or who your peers say you are, or life experiences, or memories, or anything like that. You have to get to this place where you hear the identity and the design of God in you for you. And it may be way outside what you think you are. Uh, Marianne, would you have assumed years ago that you would be trying to head up a pregnancy place? Would you have had the confidence to do it? No, I'm still working on that. Okay. <laughs> but has he not given you opportunities to build your confidence so you know he has chosen you to do that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And think about uh, the design of who you are. That was always in you. Did you always know that this is where you would end up? No. But what is it that was in you back then that you can see now? The design for babies and all that. What is What was in you? It's always the, the mercy and compassion. Mercy and compassion. And when he, when he brings your design to fulfillment and to instruction, what you'll see is, what was in you all along gets exposed and gets magnified, okay? It's just a beautiful thing. Like in my case, uh, I literally chose a career because it didn't have one thing. I could do 20 different things with this one career because the thought of having just one thing to do <laughs> was horrifying to me, okay? I, I was just like, <gasps> I can't do just one thing. I'll die. Okay. But I didn't realize that was that. So I chose this career for that opportunity. But what God did is when he moved me into my true design, which is where I am probably closer today, notice I don't get to do just one thing. I get to do a whole lot more than 20. Okay. But it's because that was my original design that he had to bring up and magnify it's not to do these 20 career things it's that desire to be multiple in all those areas so, yeah okay so let me read this last part he says uh, we need to connect our mouth with our walk refine our emotions and move into God's purpose and I wanted to read that last part because as we've been talking about last week and again this week uh, especially in us beautiful women <clears throat> emotions can be redeemed and used by God or they can be unredeemed and keep you trapped and that's what I found out with me my safe zone time where I'm screaming and hollering is not as intense anymore you know why because each one of those emotions those frustrating things that I was dealing with years and years ago I think I've shared this with you. I had journals of everything Gary had ever done bad. <clears throat> they were like movie journals, okay? Highlighted, Dolby Sound, Technicolor, the whole nine yards, okay? And what God kept reminding me is that I thought it was a way to express myself and to tell what's really happening. And, you know, because all those Christians say journal, okay? I was journaling. But what I was journaling is all my emotions. And so God said, you know, when you get really upset, you go back and read all those stupid journals. And I go, yeah, because I got to. And he goes, no. You see, that's where you're focusing on all the things the enemy meant. So he literally made me burn all my journals. That was a hard day because it was my justification. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> And when he said that, then he says, 
Now let's redeem the emotions. And what he had to do is go through, why are you angry? Why are you really, really angry? And he got to the place where he helped me redeem the emotion of anger. Uh, Why are you feeling betrayed? Why are you feeling unloved? Why are you feeling this, 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 and this? So today when he's talking about your walk and talk often don't line up because your emotions are standing in between them. And what God's wanting to do is redeem your emotions. He's not taking them away. Okay, I can get mad at the devil without any problem at all. But it's very hard for me to truly be mad at a person that fails or does something wrong or disappoints me. It's very, very hard because I don't see their reaction as just that person. I see the enemy ministering to them and making them that person. So it's a redeemed emotion. So in this season of this month, ask him, what emotions are blocking me from walking and talking the same way? Is it confidence? Okay, most people don't think of confidence as an emotion, but lack of confidence is, (laughs) right? When you have lack of confidence and you feel like you're a failure and you get emotional and you get all weepy and you feel like you can't do that. So recognize that the we don't want the enemy to have any of our emotions. None of them. So that's the soteria. That's what we're working our salvation out. We are literally saying, here's this emotion that messes me up every third day. Okay. So what do I need to do to this? How do I need to give it to Christ, lay it on the altar, and have him redeem it? Okay? Questions? Thoughts? We didn't really talk a lot about listening, but maybe we can do that better. I have a whole thing on the levels of communication. It's been a while. I might have to dig that out. The levels of communication, because everybody thinks they're really talking. And communicating well and they're doing like the first two maybe three you know Gary says there is no reason to have those other levels <laughs> there's just one level we all just need to give a dialogue a running you know of what's out there I don't want the feedback <laughs> okay